Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Nagu, uh, the TKSU for Mastec, uh, Professor I.R. Dato I.R. Abu Bakar, too many titles, Prof. You have Abu Bakar, uh, MGTC, the, the chairman of uh, Green Tech Malaysia, and the chairman of uh, Shah Malaysia, uh, Dato Ian Low, and uh, I.R. Uh, Architect Chan, um, our acting CEO, Tuan Said, um, and uh, Professor Chu and Tao, uh, Mr. Tao Wang, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today to really start our first conversations of, of climate change. A lot of people have a lot of thoughts about climate change. Many of you, because there are so many conferences al around, and I've just seen that this, uh, the audience are the C-suites, and I've seen many familiar faces, and many of you have heard me many times. So I do not know what I want to tell you about more that I want to tell you, so I will just be briefed on tell you, and as we start the conversation um, that later on in the panel, there are some things that we need to think about uh, outside of uh, Paris Agreement, etc. But just to lay the background, and although I have repeated many times, uh, let me just say that uh, Paris Agreement, Malaysia is one of the signatories of uh, Paris Agreement. Our national commitment is that we will reduce our carbon emission intensity by 45% by 2020. 2030 relative to 2005 level, and 35% of which is unconditional, 10% is conditional upon international assistance in terms of capacity building or financing of it. So at this moment, we are at 33%. We are very comfortable to reach our Paris Agreement path, uh, but um, so the, U the United Nations has come, came to us and asked us to review our, 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 our national determined commitment and we will be reviewing that and that if there is any change in our national determined commitment, uh, we will announce it in the 2020 United Nations uh, Framework uh, uh, Climate Change Con Convention in Glasgow, UK. So, so this, is, this is a background of the national target of what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve. And there are many of you that uh, the government has been doing a lot on renewable energy and, and also we are trying to push a lot more uh, green and decarbonisation. And next year, we're going to table our Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. These are all the things to help to decarbonise uh, Malaysia. But at the same time, uh, when we talk about climate change as a developing country, it is very important that we do not think climate change as just carbon reduction. We have to think climate change also in terms of climate resilient. Uh, climate, um, as just Prof just said, that uh, Paris Agreement goal, if everyone knows that this is not to, to keep the temperature of the, uh, the global temperatures, actually to limit the rise in temperature to 1.5 Celsius. That would mean that the temperature is going to rise because, uh, because the concentration of carbon is in, in, it's a big mass body. The Earth is a big mass body. It takes time to reach equilibrium and therefore the increase in temperature cannot be done, either cannot be stopped, but can be limited by a very committed and aggressive um, uh, uh, collective actions by countries all around the world. Malaysia emits 0.6% of the total um, carbon, emission, uh, carbon uh, uh, emission in the entire world. That means no matter how much we reduce, we can't actually do much. Lah. As in really, really impact much. But what we do can inspire what other people do in all around the country. The same goes to what other people do can inspire what we do. That is this multiplier, that is this uh, 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 mutual challenging that we hope that we can achieve by doing our part as a global citizen. So that is the background of the, the, the country and on the level of it. But as we start to think of climate resilience, there is a lot of people start thinking about this as the uh, just the melting ice, uh, and then, and then many of us in Malaysia will think uh, after the uh, flash flood. Usually, they say it's uh, blame it on climate change, uh, and especially the local governments. They will say it's climate change, but sometimes it's your longkang that is not cleared. You know, uh, so. <laughs> Uh, so, so for those who do not know Malay, then uh, it's your drain that is not cleared. Um, so, 
So uh, when the flash floods happen, it does not necessarily mean that it's a result of climate change. So those are some of the things that, you know, as we start to, to have conversation, that we understand what is really a climate change. It's not only just about flash flood, and not all flash floods are results of, uh, of the, na the nature. Sometimes it's of a human being, and most of the time it's from our own planners and etc. I know some of the government people will not like to hear this out, and some of the developers here as well. Uh, it's, it's getting more and more difficult to design a uh, drainage system or design the city, uh, if, uh, especially the planners. Uh, so engineers like to do this. So whenever we talk about, we design something, we say that, okay, let's design something of uh, one to a hundred years occurrence. So we will use the rain intensity and then build the, the, how big the drain is. Then realize that the next year it floods. And uh, so you build the retention pond, you, you know, you look at the historical raining pattern, then next year it floods, or next year it floods somewhere. So, so there is a changing rain pattern, and in Slango, for some of you here, that you will know that there is a changing rain pattern, that one of the years we have drought, and that the rain does not actually rain in what historically rain at the water catchment areas. So our dam is not. So the whole water system was disrupted because what we have, engineers have been thinking, is a very rigid way of thinking. Okay, what is historically doing, so let's put the dam here. So Slango has gone through that, uh, and they have actually improved their role water management. And of course, right now, they are facing with a treated water challenge that has to be done by infrastructure. But overall, it is, it is that uh, they, when we talk about climate change, it's more than just on renewable energy. I know there's a lot of excitement, especially in the new projects and all that. But really, uh, when we talk about this, we really need to think about how do we, um, how do we deal with the impact of uh, global temperature rise, uh, one, uh, on the rising sea level. What is our land mass? So in the 1.5 Celsius scenario, how much of a coastal left for Malaysia? How much of a, so what do we do to make sure that we still exist? Our coastline still exists as it is. Um, second, um, how, how frequent uh, will this extreme weather become in, in Malaysia? And how do we deal with it? Third, what, what is the impact to the food chain? And what is the impact to the healthcare system? Because at a different temperature, uh, apparently, I am not a doctor nor a biologist, apparently the virus and bacteria get active at different temperature range, and therefore, there will be time that there will be new disease coming up because the, the, the temperature has changed. So these are all the risks that comes with this. Um, this year, World Economic Forum has made this as uh, the, top, the top financial risk climate change as the top of the financial risk for corporates. This is more than uh, uh, cyber attacks, more than data theft, etc. So climate change is something that more than just about saving the world, it's really about saving ourselves as well. So how do we make, make sure that our country, uh, from the policymaker point of view, or from, from corporates point of view, how do you make sure your companies still survive? And Another question that we need to ask is, the better questions that we need to ask is, how do we make sure we do not only survive but thrive? For a Malaysia perspective, of course, how do we build new industry to deal with uh, new global challenges, for example, waste or in terms of climate change for corporate level as well, you have got to decide on what in the services and products that you can produce to help the world to tackle, to mitigate through it, whether it is in the reduction of carbon or in the adaptation of global temperature rise. There is another thing. So, so, so this is the uh, a bigger perspective on, uh, on the national level. And tomorrow, the Prime Minister uh, will launch something on, uh, on the climate change and the national uh, efforts in uh, uh, tackling climate change tomorrow. So, um, and then we will, we will announce more of what, what we are going to do tomorrow. There are two things I would like to leave it with you, is that um, just now I did not talk about renewable energy, I, I did not talk about uh, carbon reduction. Now I want to talk a little bit about carbon reduction. Uh, so although we have been pushing a lot of renewable energy, today I want to talk uh, you can later on converse about renewable energy as well, but I want to give you a perspective. Um, when we talk about decarbonization, we really have to make sure that we keep our priority right. What is the right priority? Let me just say that uh, 
I know there are a lot of shell people are here, maybe Petronas is here as well. Uh, when I was a chemical engineer student, we always talk about carbon sequestration, right? So we always talk about technology to capture the carbon underground, and then it's still not very cost efficient at, at this moment, I believe. And, but we forgot that we, as we, as our scientists or, or corporate, as we pursue the carbon capture technology, we forget that the best and most cheapest technology, perhaps on carbon sink, is to make sure that our forest is preserved. So, we, we forgot that the best carbon sequestration actually is not from the lab, but that is already exists now. That is the priority. The priority is to keep our forest. That is why Malaysia has uh, signed in, uh, in 1992, committed in Rio de Janeiro, yeah, to put, make sure that our forest cover is more than 50%, and today we are still at 55%. And so we want to keep it that way. We want to make sure that our forest is preserved. For the degraded forest, we want to make sure it is recovered to its original. And for the deforestation, uh, we want to make sure that it is recovered back as a forest. Another thing that we really need to look at is mangrove. So many of us uh, do not know, actually mangrove is also a very good uh, 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 carbon sequester. It can sequestrate and capture a lot of carbon. So whenever we think about reducing carbon, we just have to think that not so much, that of course, a lot about technology or changing and putting a lot of R&Ds on finding the right energy solution, but at the same time, perhaps we should also work on how do we uh, keep our forests and mangrove right. And the third thing I would like to uh, uh, leave with you on this priority is on peatland. Uh, Malaysians suffered one month of haze last, last, last month. Um, I do not want to talk about the, the haze, uh, how much you suffer, your, your eyes, your thing. Talk about from carbon uh, perspective. Um, I have a number here that uh, will show you the perspective of it. Every year, uh, global peatland emissions is 2,000 million ton of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And that the global for burning itself is 1,400. And most of the burning or the carbon or the burning of peatlands happen in Southeast Asia because although Southeast Asia only have about uh, 27 out of the 223 million hectares of peatlands in the entire world. Unfortunately, we are in an equatorial country. So we are hot and some of the peatlands actually lies in a very colder country that does not, or a very moist country that does not uh, uh, self-ignite. But we are at the place where you know we have peatland and there is a temperature uh, there is a time that we will have temperature uh, increase and as well as without water. What happened is that, what is the perspective of it? Peatland emission is 3.7% of the total global emission per year. Peatland burning. And yet, what we do as Malaysian or Indonesian specifically, uh, is this, is that Every year we complain about haze, but we forgot that the carbon emission results in 3.7% of a global emission. We have done so much on how to change our renewable energy, but we forgot that to put our R&D into how do we put out pit fire. Do you know that at this moment, uh, we have problem, I, I have to admit that, not that uh, we are all perfect, uh, Johan Satir, we have some peatland in Malaysia. Peatland in Malaysia accounts to about zero point something percent of the entire world. Um, uh, but we have some problems. And usually whenever our peatland on fire, it takes about three to seven days to put up. Do you know why? Because the, the firefighting process is to use water. And usually at this time, water is scarce. Right? Because there is no water, only there is pit fire. But we human beings, the Malaysians and the Indonesians, have been using water all the time for the past 20 decades. Using water. But now, of course, we have amphibious uh, uh, aircraft where you can actually get water from very far away, and then you still use water to put out uh, pit fire. 
So you, we have not been able to improve our pit, the way we put out pit fire. And that if, just imagine if we are able to cut half of the time we use to put out pit fire, how much of a carbon that we can reduce of the entire global emission. So the, the, the reason I want to throw this to you is this, is that sometimes we have put our priority or our money or resources in R&D wrongly. That is why uh, the government, we have decided to put uh, a three million seed fund next year to do an R&D research on pit fire, just specifically on how to put out pit fire without water. We, we know for so many years that water is the constraint, and yet again and again, we repeat the same mistake every year. So we will put out these three, three million seed funds, uh, and we hope to also get uh, grants from the international to really try to solve this 3.7% 3, 3 of the global emission. I think this is one of the lowest hanging fruits for global emission. And the second thing, of course, I would like to touch on is electrification. But I just want to say that it's a very good news for you, uh, Dr. Fast, the TMB. Uh, it looks like uh, it, so there, there will be an increased electrification. And el increased electrification in sky scenario seems to be the, the way to go. Therefore, it is, uh, it is uh, of, uh, very good news to the Naga and uh, very good news to electricity industry. But at the same time, our challenge is really on how do we transform our electricity generation mix uh, to, uh, to a greener one? So I don't have time to go through that, but we have a national target of reaching 20% uh, of renewable energy in our electricity generation mix by 2025. Uh, that, is, uh, more, that is about 6.9 gigawatt um, from now, 6.9 gigawatt of uh, renewable energy, more to go in uh, injecting our injecting into our current grid. Uh, so we are actually, uh, we have already have plan and we are on the, I, I mean, we are following the plan uh, very comfortably on the path uh, that we'll be able to reach that. Um, but at the same time, this is uh, something we would like to still look at is the breakthrough. Uh, all of this from now until 2025, we do not take into account uh, carbon storage. It is just a replacement of uh, uh, solar or replacement of renewable energy versus the conventional uh, conventional one. It is not so much of a storage, but as we go on, I, I think uh, a storage battery, uh, battery storage and uh, those technology must must get more mature and the cost must be more competitive as as we move on. Uh, but I believe that as we talk about climate change, it's really not talking about that is the end of the world. Uh, I believe that collectively, uh, the world can collectively take action to, to reverse uh, the end, <laughs> the end uh, or the thing that we think will come to an end. Just think about Montreal Protocol. Montreal Protocol was signed when I was very, very young. You, you also remember on the ozone depletion. Uh, because last time it used to be, aircon used to be using hydrofluorocarbon. Uh, the chlorofluorocarbon, yeah, chlorofluorocarbon, and then that is this is a very ozone depleting uh, material, and yet the world come together very quickly to reverse this. So I always believe that as we uh, and, and that uh, scientists innovate to get technology to reverse this. So I, I always believe that with corporates, with R and D, with innovation, innovation will be the answer to to the problem and to the challenges we face. So so I would like to leave this to all of you to discuss, and I hope that you have a very fruitful uh, conversations on climate change. I, I wish that we are not only conversing about climate change, we are doing something about it. With that, I'd like to thank you, and I wish you a very good session.